Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Tro, uh, we punched way high today. Like we have a way, a way legend. high. Like someone that we're, we're just going to have to absorb knowledge for the next hour, hopefully. Way, way high. Um, I am, I'm so excited. So uh, we have Dr. Karen Zinn and uh, she's just so amazing. In preparation for today's interview, I've learned so much of what she's done. I already knew she was amazing. We've interacted. She's the editor in chief of the Journal of Metabolic Health. And I knew she was a dietitian. I knew she's worked on many projects related to carbohydrates and athletics. Um, and then when I began to prepare for today, uh, my jaw dropped further and further uh, to see how much she's contributed to this field. So just a little bit about um, a little bit about Dr. Karen Zinn. Uh, she was a dietitian. Uh, she got her bachelor's in Cape Town. We know a couple of people from Cape Town, Brian. And she went and got her PhD from AUT in New Zealand. And she is an absolute powerhouse. She's written about any topic you can imagine that involves metabolic health and low carb space. I saw work, I mean, certainly I'm familiar with her work on sports performance uh, and nutrition, but then I found out she's written on diabetic cardiomyopathy. She's talking about, you know, uh, uh, creating protocols. She's um, written a number of papers in this space and, well, as I said, my jaw dropped further and further and further and further. And I'm just so happy to have you here. Can we do first names, Karen? Can we do that? Can I be Troy oh, and Brian and 100%. Karen? <laughs> okay. Absolutely. I'm so happy to have you here. And I know Brian feels oh, the same you. way. Thank you. It's great to be here. So Yeah, it's great to have the science, like someone who's looked at the science and, and coming from your background, it's hard to, you know, how was it like, how were you classically rate? You know, taught and what did you start saying hey maybe what i've been taught isn't 100 percent accurate or correct okay so that so that's a story that that's a big story and trained trained as a, a mainstream dietitian in cape town i will say that you and many of your listeners will probably know professor tim noakes yes i think i heard so, of him before yeah yeah, yeah that guy yeah no he's a legend he's a legend here yeah, for sure he's a legend and he taught me when I did my undergrad in physiology he taught me my exercise science um so he, he you know then I went on to, to go study dietetics and then it was only years later um where we connected again over this whole low carb movement where I ended up going back as an expert witness in his um in his nutrition trial uh, back in Cape Town but um in the interim so I I was a very loyal dietitian to to the cause you know to the food pyramid to the whole healthy healthy whole grains um, we need to eat two-thirds of our diet coming from carbohydrate because carbohydrate is the main fuel of exercise it's the main fuel generally um, and I don't know if you know very many dietitians but the ones that I know we, we typically as a as a community we, we're pretty conservative um, and we're pretty anti-risk so when I was um, going through my, you know, my early years of being a dietitian, I, my colleagues, my nutritionist colleagues would all be going, you know, have you tried this supplement? Have you tried that supplement? And I'd be going, well, no, it's food first and it's all about food and we don't look at supplements. And so we, we kind of stick to the straight line. Um, and that's exactly how I lived my professional life as a dietitian. Um, you know, telling telling my athlete clients and telling my insulin resistant clients to eat things like creamed rice and, you know, toast for breakfast. And, you know, this is all kind of embarrassing looking back now, um, professionally embarrassing. But it was about 10 years ago where um, I really started to, well, well, I just flipped really. And the story behind that was we, myself and my colleague at AUT, Professor Grant Schofield, we took on a PhD student, Dr. Catherine Crofts, and she started looking at insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. And she connected with 
Joseph Kraft, the late Joseph Kraft, who had looked at the Kraft patterns. So she she was the first to kind of connect with him. And he basically gave her his data. Like it came over, she ended up going to Chicago and it came over in some, you know, antiquated form that we had to convert uh, to something we could understand today. Um, but it was during that time where we we started looking at this concept of hyperinsulinemia. And I had never come across the term before. Um, I had studied a degree in physiology and the term insulin resistance had never, ever been mentioned, which I find really interesting. So of course, because it had never been mentioned, um, I had no reason to question why we'd manage a condition like type two diabetes, which is characterized by insulin resistance with a whole bunch of carbohydrate. I had no reason to question that um, because it was all about nutrients and food groups and, and all that and fuel. So when Catherine Grant and I started having these conversations, I was brought on the supervision as a skeptic. Let's bring Karen on because she's, you know, she's a conservative dietitian and a skeptic. And there were some questions asked about conditions, uh, chronic conditions that were characterized by insulin resistance and dietary management that I just couldn't answer. You know, the mere question, why do you manage type 2 diabetes with a whole bunch of carbohydrate? And I'm, no, I'm, sh I'm sure there's a good reason for it. It's this, that, and the other. The usual, the usual story comes out. And then I, I started delving into the literature. And when you, when you dig deep, and to be honest, digging deep into the literature is a hard thing to do. So I don't even think I dug deep. I, I dug just below the surface. And that was enough for me to go, oh, my goodness, this is, um, th this is colossal. And at the same time, um, Prof Noakes was carrying on about low carb and he was being annihilated um, around the world um, to, to keep quiet. And, and one of the things that totally changed my mind was, um, you know, Prof Tim Noakes, the last time he'd made a noise around um, fluid guidelines for athletes and hypernatremia, and all the dietitians were going, well, you know, if you – um, if you say drink to thirst, which is what he was saying, that would be um, that would be bad practice because if you drink to thirst, means you're really dehydrated and, and, and you know there's a there's a problem. Anyway, long story short, um, got the ACSM guidelines changed um, because of hyperinsulinemia and Prof Noakes's noise about drink to thirst guidelines. So when he started making a noise about low carb, I couldn't you know I couldn't ignore it. This is a top scientist um, and just because he's a little bit noisy um, you, you can't turn a blind eye so so collectively those were the things that made me really look at what I was taught and um, and how I was going to move forward in my career told you it was a long story <laughs> no and don't you think I mean in in retrospect don't you think it, it was more that the observation was obese people get diabetes, so fat must make you fat. So you go on a low fat diet and you have to eat something. So then carbohydrates became the the standard. And then they go, you got to eat six times a day to keep your sugars high all the time <laughs> instead of yeah. having spite. And it it's just how this mindset that no one ever said, hey, wait a minute, let's let's look at little kids get it. Little kids go, the more sugar you eat, the higher sugars go. Then don't eat sugar. Like, but the greatest scientists can't understand that concept somehow. No, no, exactly right. But I think the the biggest problem with that whole argument scientific argument is th there's a little bit of truth to it which is the whole um fat is um heavy in calories right so fat's got nine calories per gram versus carbs and protein which are four so it made sense actually that to get into calorie deficit which you need for weight loss you need to drop fat because you know you'll, you'll get there e easier um and, and and to be fair um when you look at the national weight control registry which is the big US database about um, people who have lost at least 5% of their weight and kept it up for, for at least 12 months. So they, they go into this database. I'm not sure if it's still um, still operational. but It is, it's, it it's is still, still operational. It, it is. Okay, yeah. well, it, it's really interesting. When you look at the, the types of um, dietary approaches um, that achieve weight loss, you get a whole range. So I, th I think, you know, weight loss doing high carb, low carb, vegan, vegetarian, um, exercise only, intermittent fasting, blue carbs, green carbs, whatever you want. As long as you get into a calorie deficit and maintain that, you can achieve 
weight loss and you can sustain it at, at great cost. But I mean, you and I know, and your listeners know that where low carb makes a difference is that um, weight loss is like the pleasant side effect that you get with these this whole host of other benefits. And that to me was, was the clincher. It's not just about weight loss. It's about a whole lot more. Yeah, I mean, you know, you brought up so many topics here that that uh, this idea of a calorie deficit, you know, I, I think it's just, uh, you know, I, I think even our obsession with calories is, you know, rated, is rooted, sorry, in religion, as kind of, you know, Brian had sort of mentioned, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, people who get diabetes, or they happen to be obese. So of course, you know, you have to, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, disease of gluttony. And when you look at the focus on calories, you know, the focus, I think is still, um, you know, it's rooted in religion, like, you know, obesity is an inability to, you know, control eating or this hedonic drive to eat. Uh, and, and I think that that's where sort of the zealotry in this field comes from. It's the fact that it's basically rooted in religion. You know, I've basically eaten gluttonously over the last 10 years and kept 150 pounds of weight off, right? I've, you know, I just ate literally right before this call, a pound and a half of brisket, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, somehow my weight stays off. And we know now, you know, that that there's explanations potentially rooted in this energy balance theory. And I say theory because it's truly a theory. I don't I'm not sure that anybody's verified it yet. But, you know, we know that people who have low carb diets uh, or maintain these diets, they're somehow expending energy, whether it's ketones leaving the mouth, whether it's ketones urinating, whether it's just moving more because you feel better and you're not, you know, maybe it's you're you're sleeping better. And so you're your, uh, uh, you know, your hunger goes down also that that could be a component, whatever it is, you know, um, there's like this, this, these effects. And I wonder if the reason why we had to dig into the literature and it wasn't accepted as part of the mainstream is because of this sort of religion, you know, if it's 80, 80% of docs just did what they were told and other docs did the same thing and they're high priests you know, at their, at their universities, you know, this is what they said and they, you know, and they followed. Um, what do you, you know, when you look back at your own transition, you know, maybe all of us can sort of comment on it. How much of this was just believing what we were told and not thinking for ourselves? I, I think most of it, you, you've hit the nail on the head, um, whether you call it religion or dogma or whatever, it's whatever it is, it is incredibly powerful um, and, and I think the, what's interesting, like, you know, being a, an associate professor at AUT and I teach students, the students these days are, are quite curious. You know, we teach them how to critique. We teach them how to look at headlines that say meat is worse for you than smoking. Um, and, and we teach them to look at the studies and to critique what's wrong with them, what's right with them, and to come up with the, with the, with the truth. But honestly, when I was a student, again, confession of a, you know, of a young student, it was quite embarrassing. I don't think I ever asked why. I, I didn't ask questions. It was like, these were the professors. <clears throat> and in, in my day, you kind of respected the people who told you the things and you just didn't question it. So whether it was dogma or just uh, generational, I'm making myself sound old here, but um, I, I guess... <laughs> I just accepted what I was told and never questioned. And of course, when you worked with people, when I worked with people in, in my clinical practice and you did low fat, high carb calorie deficit, it actually did work. It did work. So it's not like you went, oh, well, this is wrong. What's going on? It did work, but it doesn't work anywhere near um, how we know it can work. Um, and I think also one of the biggest issues um, with this whole dogma and religion and, and everything is that we looked at everything in, in silos and we looked at the narrow context of obesity in relation to calories. What we didn't 
look at was metabolic health. And that's where that whole concept has grown over the last several years. We didn't look at leptin and ghrelin and appetite control. We didn't look at insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia and how that affects every single system in the body. So we didn't think about what the food, we didn't question about what the food we ate did to our hormones, into our neurotransmitters, into our body systems. We just thought of food as calories. And I think that's what stopped us short of actually realizing the truth. And then, as you say, you know, years and years and, and, and years of everyone just going, this is how it is. It's really hard, you know, when, when a couple of people go, well, it isn't like this. It's like, well, but of course it is that we, you know, we're getting good results. People are losing, losing weight. So do you know what I mean? It's short of, it, it's sort of, of, of where we are now, which is looking at metabolic health and i think we can hopefully change the religion and the dogma if we reframe the, the question and, and the cause and look at the, the the broader context so it is still a religion and we're still going to try and change it but i think we need to we need to think about a different uh different way forward than just talking about calories because you just get nowhere with that well, you know, I want to sort of add on this. So you you come to this realization, you start questioning things, you start learning more, and and I mean your your research career and you know is absolutely exploded. And I I knew of your work just having you know sort of been interested in in this space over the last ten years, and I did not realize the depth of your work. And so, can you give the you know the the sort of the idea? you know, the, the audience and, you know, now you're contributing and adding to the scientific literature, like help, help us understand what's driving you to do this, because it's not easy. I mean, I'm looking at your publications. It's not easy to do that. Even as a, you know, mentor to, to PhD students, it's not easy to do what mm -hmm. you've done. So what, what's drive, what's driving you? Um, What's driving me? I think, you know, for risk of using a cliche, once you see something, you can't unsee it. So I couldn't just continue along, bumbling along my career, um, doing research about what happens if you put more fruit and vegetables on a workplace table? Oh, look, people eat more fruit and vegetables. Let me publish that. It, it was just so meaningless. Um, so once we kind of got into this whole area of insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia and everything changed, honestly, I almost, um, I almost gave up my career. I thought, I can't, I can't believe this. Um, this is not happening. Honestly, I was the margarine in the fridge person, um, cereal for breakfast. I'd, I'd overeat, even though I'm not overweight. I've never been overweight. I used to eat, you know, beautiful muesli, not only for breakfast, but you know, after dinner, for snacks. So, you know, there were these average practices. Um, and I thought, oh, my God, how am I going to carry on my career with this new knowledge? <clears throat> and I sat on it for a few months over kind of the summer period. And I, I, I tried um, changing my practice with, uh, with colleagues and with, with clients. And then it sort of, it, it, all, it all started falling into place. Um, but... I, I will say to you that it hasn't been an easy ride. And over 10 years of doing this, I've had um, about five complaints, formal complaints to me from our dietitian's board. Um, in the early days, it was from my colleagues, not from clients, from, from my dietitian colleagues who, <laughs> instead of calling me up and saying, hey, Karen, what's going on? Let's have a conversation, decided to put um, formal complaints in to me. Uh, sorry, in um, about me to the dietitians board, which which I had to, um, you know, which I had to deal with. So, um, but again, you know, once you believe in something, you just you just take. I don't know. For some reason, I must be thick skinned or really resilient. But I thought, you know, I'm just going to take this because because I really believe that um, what we've been taught is is just not right. So in my career, I was really interested in jumping on board with everything that I could um, in, in this area. We, we didn't really term it metabolic health 10 years ago. It was more like, oh, let's, let's start researching low carb. So we kind of dropped our, you know, boring, let's look at fruit and veg, you know, impact um, research-wise. 
um, from a public health angle and looked more at um, at low carb in various contexts. So um, one of the first things we did um, was was we wrote a book myself, my colleague Grant, and a chef Craig who who'd opened the first low carb restaurant in Auckland called Loop. We wrote a series of books um, called What the Fat, and um, and we thought we got together. It was actually Grant's wife, Louise. Um, she got us together and she said, listen, I've got this idea. What do you reckon? Um, writing books is, is not about making money. So you're not going to make money. Um, but, you know, at best, it's about getting the message across. And, and you know, we across something. What do you reckon? Shall we do it? And we decided to just take off and do it. So we wrote these books and then we got into all the research we possibly could. So we looked at low carbon athletes. We did some work with um, Defence Force. We had um, some connections in the Defence Force. So we said, hey, let's do this. Let's do the study looking at how low carb compared to mainstream um, it impacts things like health for the, the growing workforce of, of the Defence Force, which, is get, which are getting fatter and more unhealthy each year each year, let's actually do some research. We looked at research um, on uh, menopausal women and then it just kind of boomed from, from there. We, we did a study looking at obese children um, of low socioeconomic uh, status and that was hard research to do. But you know, along the way, we, we came out with some really, really good information, which you know, when you come out with good information, it eggs you on. It's like, wow, this is, this is good. We're making some good change here. And it sort of sp spiraled. So, you know, while we were doing this research, I was sorting out the complaints to the dietitians board um, and applying for research grants, which were getting turned down left, right and center up until quite recently. So, you know, it has been a, an interesting journey, but certainly worthwhile because it makes me feel like I'm, I'm doing something um, or co I'm contributing to a space which is really, really meaningful, not just going through the motions of doing what I was told and getting average outcomes. And I think that's so amazing. Like when you look at what Professor Noakes did, you know, that he had to stand up against, like he's the most decorated guy around. He stands up and he has all these people who've never treated a patient in their lives criticizing him, <clears throat> these young doctors, excuse me. Um, you know, and it's just amazing the lack of respect. It's good to question, but in a respectful way and say, Teach me why you're saying this. Let me learn from you rather than saying you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about all of a sudden, even though you've been the most decorated person around. That's why when you jumped to his defense and other people did, like Tro and I wouldn't be doing this podcast without your efforts, really, because if Noakes goes down and says, okay, forget it. I'm not fighting this fight. Then mm -hmm. everyone else has a target on their back. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And um, I I'll tell you this interesting story. So several years ago, we did some work. And, you know, in New Zealand, um, we're not that good at getting a lot of money to do a lot of research because um, it's a really small country, but we've got really good connections. So um, one of our connections was a, a guy who um, – who who was heading up one of one of the big boarding schools in New Zealand and he'd worked at AUT and and he'd come across what we were doing and he and he said you know let's let's see if we can do some work with these kids because you know the, the chef was cooking cooking the meals we I'd analyzed the recipes and you know these kids were were being given something like 50 equivalent tea, teaspoons of, of sugar in their day like they were getting breakfast lunch and dinner they were getting snacks everything was carbohydrate based after dinner they were getting dessert like um, you know canned peaches and ice cream every day and unlimited amounts of bread so we analyzed the, the menus this was a great project I, unfortunately i never published on it because it was one of those things that just we just started doing um and the chef at the school, Dilworth had had read what the fat, and he was a real skeptic. And then he lost ten k's, and he came back, and he's like, "Oh my god, this actually works! How about we change the menu for the school, but not not go? Oh, let's go! Let's put all these young kids on a ketogenic diet. It's let's see if we can improve the menu and make it more whole food based and take out some of the sugar. Um, and we did it, you know, in New Zealand, I guess in any country, you've got to get the process right. And we did it really, really well. We got the parents on board. We got the kids on board. We got the teachers on board. We did talks. We did all sorts of things. And 
Um, and then the food intake changed and we took about 40 teaspoons of sugar out of their menu and we gave them good whole food. And these kids, they were losing weight, you know, not at, not at um, you know, massive rates. They were just losing probably the excess body fat that they had. Um, we had them cooking their own omelets for breakfast. We had, you know, we were doing all these amazing things. And then one of the dietitians in, in New Zealand, we got a bit of media on this. One of the dietitians who was a well-known dietitian um, wrote into the dietitians board, but also to the ministry of education saying, how can you be doing this? How can you be experimenting on our children? And I just thought the world has gone mad we've improved their health we've taken sugar out of the menu we've upped the protein we've upped the fat it's it's good quality food everyone's thriving we did focus groups for the kids and they were like oh yeah no this food is cool you know so there was no harm yet complaints just came in it just to me it's it just seems people are you know people are living either under a rock or just i don't know do you, do you think they're living under thing. a rock or do you think they have financial incentives like uh you know, because we see it on social media. There's some people that attack Jason Fung, for instance, and I go, oh, all those guys are pushing the same drug that came out that same day that they, for some reason, yeah. decided to attack this guy. So you start looking at when they say, well, you don't have to change lifestyle, just shoot this drug and you're good. So you wonder how much of that is that they have financial interest or they have grants coming in or things. So if you say don't eat certain cereals, for instance, as uh, you know, Gary Fedke will tell you, that uh, then it becomes a, a problem. All of a sudden, now you get reported and you're, and you're a threat to the system because it's not natural for people just to attack each other on social media. Like you said, pick up the phone and call me and go, hey, Brian, what are you doing? Why are you saying this? I know. Right? Yeah. Do you have reasoning behind what you're doing or are you just some nutty guy, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, people don't like conflict in general, but they're quite happy to um, add that conflict behind your back. Um, but this particular dietitian, she, um, you know, she she did do some work for, um, for you know, Powerade and some of those some of those companies and cereal companies and stuff but it's interesting i don't think that um i don't think you'd be attacked because of the necessarily of the conflict i think they are involved in doing stuff with companies because they truly believe that mm -hmm. um carbohydrates are the thing to have so it, it, it's a bit like if an it's a bit like if a if an egg company said to me, hey, Karen, do you want to write some stuff about the importance of eggs? I'd go, yeah, sure. But I, I don't see that as a, I don't see that as a conflict because I think eggs are great. Um, it's a whole food. And I think these people see the same thing with cereals and with, um, with sports drinks for athletes because they truly believe that's what should be done, um, which is real brainwashing, real brainwashing. Um, and just 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 on that point, I, I um, published an article a few years ago, and it was looking at the um, nutrient reference values. Um, so basically, the nu nutrition, um, uh, I guess the what's the word I'm looking for, um, the nutrition content really of a low carb diet. So we developed some hypothetical diets, and um, and we looked at comparing the micronutrients to the NRVs, which is like the standards or the RDAs or the RDIs that you guys are familiar with. Um, and we wrote a paper on it. I, I linked up with a couple of dietitians in, in Australia and it was published in the BMJ, which was great. And then a couple of years later, we did the same research with hypothetical diets for overweight adolescents, tried to publish in the same journal. And it was reviewed by two dietitians who worked for like the equivalent of Goodman Fielder or Unilever or something. And one, one of them had, um, had been doing a lot of work with fruit juice companies and we got absolutely slammed and reject, reject, reject. So um, I appealed it and I said, listen, there's massive conflicts in, in terms of your reviewers. Like, please can we, you know, you've, 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 you've you guys have published the, the partner article here. Can you at least give this another go? And they said, okay, we'll send it back to us, but the same reviewers are going to review it. <laughs> like, yeah. Kidding, and that's what I mean me. when you, when your peers are idiots, peer review is yeah. not very helpful. Right. And, and yeah. you know, those people go, okay, look, let's maybe a different approach. Let's look at this. I'm, that's why I've been surprised is this lack of, even interest in saying, okay, let's assess this. So there's some benefits. What What is the nutritional content? And Absolutely. are we harming people? Because I would think someone like you, 
Like if you came across additional information and go low carb keto is dangerous, you would say that I'm this is what I'm seeing. Because 100%. it's not a religion, 100%. right? For us too. It's like, hey, if things change, even, you know, we invited Robert Lustig on and he says, you know, I'm not a keto guy necessarily. So I don't know if I'm a good fit for, you know, I'm a whole foods guy. It's like, so are we. It's like, there's yeah. no conflict in that because, hey, if whole foods are, are good and if you're metabolically healthy, I think you could eat a different diet than someone who's absolutely metabolically sick. 100%, 100%. And I think we've all got this, um, this element of duty of care. So if you, if you, and, and I guess the whole, high ldl thing is 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 interesting to see how it's playing out because um it you know if you if you really think that L, high ldl is is harmful well well then you've got to you've got to really think carefully about what you're doing so it's 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 allowing you to move forward quite cautiously with the science um and being quite sure that you're not harming people um yeah it, it, interesting <laughs> What what are you most proud of as your contribution so far? Is there something that you say, you know, this was a big, this was a big paper or a big concept that that is now becoming more accepted, or is not accepted yet that you think is the big thing that's coming? Um, there are a couple of things. Um, you know, as an academic, I should probably say on oh, my most cited paper on the highest impact journal, but I I, I don't. I think my my two most you know proud moment well i guess there's, there's three really the, the one was the what the fat book in the series um because that really <clears throat> it, it revolutionized new zealand um it brought new zealand into this whole whole food low carb world and our, our point of writing the books was to get messages out in a safe way that included practice and science and recipes and um you know we we sold probably a couple of hundred thousand copies, which for New Zealand is quite big. I know for the US mm -hmm. is probably a drop in the ocean, but for for us that was <clears throat> that was massive. It was translated into different languages and all sorts of things. So that that was really big. Um, I think the Tim Noakes thing was really big. Interestingly, it was big in South Africa. In New Zealand, nobody even knew what was going. On. Like honestly, it was like what who? So it it was it was kind of my another really proud moment because I was going back to where I was born and contributing um, to an important um, space there. But then, you know, a colleague of mine always says, you know, your, your best work is still ahead of you. And I'd like to think that that might be true. And we, we're doing some, <clears throat> excuse me, we're doing some really important work um, with type two diabetes and pre-diabetes at the moment. We're doing some implementation science work and that. I reckon that is going to be when I retire one day, I'll look back, I'll sit on my rocking chair and go, that was my proudest moment. So that's hey, what, what are you doing? I, we we want to know. We want to know more yeah. about that. Like okay. what, what's your intervention? What are you doing in this? Okay. So we, so I've been applying for research. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, we've been um, applying for research grants for the last six years to do something on low carb, and we've been given the thumbs down each time. And then a couple of years ago, we got a $1.4 million research grant from the government, so endorsement from the government, to look at um, the primary care setting. So that's, you know, GP clinics, doctor's clinics, um, looking at the way that healthcare is delivered to people with pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes in New Zealand. So three-phase study. Um, it's not an intervention. It's uh, what we call implementation science, where you apply something, you evaluate it, and then you kind of move it forward based on the outcomes. It's sort of translational research. It's, it's as-it-happens research, which is, which is really um, quite different from doing like an ICT. Um, but it, it's quite unnerving sometimes because half the time you don't know what you're doing. You're just rolling with it. I know that sounds very unscientific, but it's, it's very interesting research. So the first phase of our research was to evaluate a couple of clinics in New Zealand. So we've got connections. We've got um, doctors that are doing um, a, a low-carb um, type of ad ad advice um model or system with their with their patients or their clients and they're bringing in health coaches and they've got support mechanisms like um cooking um uh, cooking demonstrations once a week and um online uh, groups support groups they've got education sessions so they've got these support initiatives and there are two of our kind of mates um, that we've known for a long time so the, the first part of this research was to evaluate what they're doing in terms of a medical audit 
um, and also some focus groups looking at what, what are their experiences and also what are the patient experiences of this model of care using low-carb whole food. So we've done that. We're in the second phase of the research now, which is to apply the model in 20 medical centers in one what we call a PHO, which is a primary health care organization. So, um, so we, we're trying to get this concept on, you know, we're trying to get 20 medical centers um, on board with this concept of, of changing the way that they deliver health care. And then the third year, I mean, the second and the third year is actually sort of amalgamated into one. We're trying to get the rest of New Zealand doing this. So we're just going to push wider. And we, we've just had, um, we just had this big, uh, conference uh, last weekend or the weekend before and we called it whole hashtag whole NZ um, it was called hashtag whole NZ hui and hui is a the Maori word for um, for, a, for a meeting or a gathering and it was invite only so we invited invite or application only so we invited health professionals so doctors um, nurses um, you know pharmacists health coaches people in um, in sort of medical administration, clinical directors, all sorts of things. And we had this full day. David and Jen Unwin came over to New Zealand for it. They are advisors on our project. Um, and there were sessions on, you know, David presented his amazing work from the UK. Jen presented her amazing work on food addiction. And then we had panels. We had like a health coach panel. We had a doctor panel. We had a patient panel. So patients gave their stories. And then we had a call to action workshop at the end of it um, about what can you do to actually help us move this along and, and create some um, some change in the healthcare system. So, you know, I'm still buzzing from that. The enthusiasm and the passion was just palpable. Um, we only had one dietitian there. I do want to say that. Like, I want to bring dietitians along because they are part of the story. But there is resistance. There is a lot of resistance for um, for a, a, a lot of reasons, really. But um, so, so that's our diabetes project, and we're in the middle of it, and um, we're loving it. <laughs> I have a question, you know, along the dietitian line, and I would say in, in the medicine line too, is looking around and you look at how sick we are as populations. Oh, yeah, not- it's like doctors are in such a, because everyone's sick, they're in such a panic mode that they have to write a prescription that they don't have time. They don't even want to talk about that. Like, Tro and I talk to doctors and like, I don't even ask about marital problems because if I, I can't be there for an hour explaining that when I, mean, I got 20 other patients waiting, you know, yep. Yep. it's exactly. a big problem. Exactly. And, and, and I do think the whole writing a prescription is, is easy medicine, right? Because as you say, it's making the patient feel like they're getting something, they're paying money, they're actually getting something that is, you know, going to help them. Um, and you get them out the door quickly. And that's why kind of nothing changes because you don't really think there's anything wrong with the system. And it's only when you realize that actually it's more about lifestyle medicine and lifestyle medicine, you know, food is medicine, exercise is medicine. Um, when you get that concept, um, that's when you start getting the, the job satisfaction. But that's hard to do, you know, talking to people about changing their behaviors and then um trying to change your system with bringing in the multidisciplinary team, that behavior change um, contribution to your conversations is, is, is hard. You know, it, it, it's really hard to get people to change their, their, their worlds. So you can see why um, medicine stays as it is. It's certainly not right, but you can see why people are like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not interested. It's just, oh, it sounds too hard. But then when the people change when the docs change when the health coaches come on board the, some of the dietitians that are changing and coming on board they realize that they're making such a difference the patients are really getting meaningful sustained change they have you know great job satisfaction working with a doctor now a solo doctor in a practice um dr marcus hawkins and you know he works like a dog every day but you know every night he's emailing me going right what's our next paper what can we do here well, so he's so motivated and he's so excited about this work that, um, you know, burnout is, is not even a thing. Yeah, and you work the same amount of hours or more and you're not burned out because you see the vision of what's coming. And I think yeah. that's what we have to, and that's what people like Tro and I have to realize is that we can't do it all. And so if we could review the labs and use our expertise and understanding metabolic health stuff, and then not doing all the day-to-day coaching. I've been doing all the coaching, everything in my practice, right? So yeah. when you have people who are competent that you trust and go, okay, 
you know, you're going to be working with Sally now, you know, you're going to be working with Amy now. Mm. And so we all work together as a team and we all kind of have the same messaging and that we can have this ongoing, because we know, you know, I talk to people all the time and they go to an eight week program. Well, after that one, mm -hmm. right. You yeah, get a gastric exactly. bypass. Then what do you do? They just do it and say, okay, good luck. Go back to your old ways. And so that's yeah. the craziness of the system is that we don't have this long-term follow-up and this human connection. That's so critical. Okay, and that's absolutely. what Tro and I are, we're trying to put that together to have doctors in every state. They go, okay, you're in Idaho here. This doctor can take care of you, mm -hmm. you know, and we could use the same health coaches and, and really, really impact people because all those people, who benefit become e evangelists and they go out and help other people, you know? And so, you know, it's just getting that ball rolling sometimes. Well, yeah, what absolutely. we definitely should do, sorry, what we definitely should do is that paper from Dr. Hawkins and you that, that uh, you know, was recently published. I know he had a recent audit um, mm -hmm. from in the Journal of Metabolic Health. We should definitely include that in the show notes. So everybody you should go out and read it. You know, every time you have a doc that writes a clinical audit, guys, you should read it. You know, it tells you how they're doing things, what they're doing. It's like a peek into healing. They're, you know, they're seeing something and they're so profoundly excited. They're looking to share it. You know, I, I've never met this Dr. Hawkins, but I, I want him. I want to meet him now. You know, yeah, he's great. And he's on our research project. He's on our diabetes project. And we've also just published a letter to the editor to the Journal of um, Primary Health Care. Um, and it was basically um, a call to New Zealand to, you know, wake up and change your guidelines. And it was like a, you know, thousand word letter about how every, not every, but um, a lot of countries in the world have changed their diabetes nutrition guidelines to align with, you know, the whole um, carbohydrate reduction approach. Yet in New Zealand, you click on, you, you go to the diabetes site and you go on dietary management and it says uh, low carb diets are not recommended. I mean, seriously, not recommended. So we wrote a little letter to the editor um, and it was just recently published. And uh, they are, I think the the journal is going to contact the Diabetes Society to get comment from them. So that will probably, you know, blow up and I'll, I'll get more complaints and things. But, you know, th this is this is what we this is what we put our um, we put ourselves on the line to to do what's right. You know, just in that same are not going to benefit. Just on that same token, you know, uh, you know, here in the United States, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends against low carb diets. And, you know, there's so many of us here who are working at the SMHP, you know, who, who it just makes our blood boil. And well, they're recommending bypass surgeries for these nine year olds and being on a drug and, that you inject every single week for the rest of your life. And like, wait a minute. But a low carb yeah. diet requires intense medical supervision, right? And, you know, and then you look at their, you look at the way they analyze data, you know, they're using four to one ketogenic diets. Like they're not even mm -hmm. citing a well formulated low carb diet. They're, they're, you know, they're referencing a very restricted diet used for seizures. And, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we, uh, you know, I'm sure you know, because we've, We've submitted this and, you know, hopefully it'll be reviewed soon. Um, but we're, you know, we're pissed off, you know, there, and there's, there's a lot of us, you know, and there's seven authors that got together and seven docs that said enough is enough. Like we have to write against this. And the problem is, is when you go to write against the AAP, you know, they won't publish it. Right. Mm, yeah. So, and it's so important. People don't understand, you know, they say, Tro, you know, why is, you know, why did the SMHP work with uh, Oasis, you know, to make a, you know, a home base, a journal of metabolic health? It's because, you know, we're really try to elevate this as much as we can, because that we need reviewers who know metabolic health. We need yeah. uh, editors who know metabolic health. Well, we have one, you know, uh, certainly, but we need, you know, we need to create these, uh, infrastructure to support this field because out there, you know, there's nobody, there's nobody wanting to publish this. You faced it yourself, right? You, you publish an article and you couldn't even get a fair review. And so yeah. like, that's why this is important. People don't realize, go visit the journal of metabolic health, go visit the SMHP, you know, these, you know, these institutions need your help, need your viewership, need, you know, go submit an article, you know, uh, go submit yeah. a review article um, because we need to 
bring these systems up. We need to bring yeah, the whole I, system. I agree. I agree. And I will just say that the Journal of Metabolic Health is certainly not a soft touch. Like I'm a, I'm a staunch editor in that if it doesn't meet the scope of the journal, then it won't go out for review. But I'm also really, I'm, I'm adamant that if, you know, you read the abstract and if it meets the scope of the journal, then it deserves to go out for review. Even if it doesn't agree with the things that I have in my head about metabolic health, if it meets the scope of the journal. It deserves um, to guard for review because otherwise it, it becomes another uh, biased place, another political story. Um, and, and we don't like in terms of getting reviewers, I getting reviewers is so, is, so, is such a tricky process. Um, and there's always, um, there's always thinking that, oh, you just tap your mates on the shoulder and say, can you just review that? I go through a massive process. I get about 20 people that I get off the internet that have published in this area and I approach them and they don't know who, who you are. And you, you, you try and get the review. So you try to do the best job of getting the best people to review um, review the work. So I, I do think... Um, I do think the Journal of Metabolic Health is 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 going to is going to get there and it's going to grow because um, the audience and the readership are really enthused and passionate about this area. Yeah, and you know it's the whole ecosystem that has to grow, and uh, there's so many docs out there. You know, we had uh, David Unwin who wrote that article. You know, really a call to action. Every single you know doc out there needs to publish their clinical audit, mm -hmm. right? And what better place? Uh, to publish, you know, your clinical audits on metabolic health than, yep, than the yep. Journal of Metabolic Health, right? Um, yeah. And, so and again, when you, important. you know, from my from my perspective, you know, when when a journal article comes in, you've got to assess whether, you know, the subject is novel and, you know, is, does it deserve to be published and everything. And you get to a point with audits where you go, is it novel? Well, no, it's not novel. But the the mere fact that there are lots of audits is actually making a point and saying something. So there is novelty in every single audit for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think you know it's the message that comes out. If the if this work is well done and it's well written up and it's well reviewed, that even though the novelty factor is not necessarily there, it's so important for people to see their audits left, right, and center. This is actually a thing. Oh my God, we need to do this. And it's actually, to be honest, it's best practice, you know, that um, that quality assurance that you are um, doing in your practice and actually publishing it for the rest of your profession to see should be part of best practice. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I've been telling Brian. For next step, it would be to get Brian to publish some papers. We'll 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 help you do that. Brian. I think I'm gonna have a case report coming up pretty soon that I love yeah. about a guy that, that was on hospice and the hospice nurse kept telling the the wife he's not gonna get better. Don't give hope, and and he just got kicked off of hospice because he got too healthy. When they said he wasn't gonna improve, yeah, he he with advanced dementia, and Parkinson's. They put him on a ketogenic diet, and he's playing catch with his granddaughter instead of drooling on the floor all day. It's amazing. Like you don't see miracles like that, you know? And, and so when you see things like that, you go, man, what if that was the standard of care? Why don't we got and stop giving them seed oils and sugar and start giving them some good nutrition. Right. Um, and it's amazing what, what we can accomplish and engaging with them and doing red light therapy and doing, uh, you know, uh, 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 sauna or, you know, bingo night, whatever it is, take them to the zoo and let them learn about animals again. And, you know, just stimulating the brain and see what we can do instead of just giving up and going, just send them there to die. You know, in the U S that's how it is. And so, you know, the, these kind of things are exciting to see what we can do. And, you know, we're seeing studies on ALS and, and, you know, all these horrific diseases, where we can intervene and people get better. You know, that's why it's important what you're doing. And I think that's why these little things that you do raise flags in people, because if you can show at one school, okay, we changed their nutrition plan and gave them real food and all these kids lost weight and they got better and they didn't get diabetes. That threatens the system because all of these other schools, if you start implementing that nationwide, now people aren't buying this juice that she's representing or these, 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 yeah. you know, snacks that are not healthy for kids. And, you know, the amount of money in this is unbelievable. Just look at the hospitals, what they're giving people, you know, and that was my question to this guy at the, at the nursing home. I said, doesn't this cut into your bottom line budget? Because you're spending a lot more on food for these people and, and nutritional value instead of getting chicken nuggets, you know, and French fries. And he said, you know, I, I make a lot more money that way because people aren't going, getting sick and they're not dying. And so my population, you know, he went through the entire COVID without losing anyone. And you go, there's something to that investment of 
keeping your people healthy and keeping them from going to that next level of care too, because there's always going to people be people who need that. So, you know, the, the argument was if you get people healthy and send, he sent six people home from his nursing home that were supposed to be there to die and people critiqued them and said, don't you think that hurts your business? He said, if I could send people home, I'll have no end of business. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a, yeah. there's a real disconnect between that. Um, you know, the, the business, the bottom line business and your kind of ethic, ethical and, and, and moral obligation to, to truly care for people, how you think they should be careful. I mean, there's, there's always a fine line, but you know, money trumps a lot of the time, which is, which is, you know, a bit sad. Well, I mean, yeah. it's our job to find those financial systems and models that reward right, that reward great outcomes, right? So money doesn't have to work against us. It can work for us, right? Mm -hmm. So tying physician outcomes, <clears throat> you know, how well they do for in the service of their patients, you know, value-based care. This is, a you know, a possibility. This yeah. is the next paper I'm working on with Dr. Unwin. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to step out very soon, guys. But um, is going to be on, it's all over the world. Metabolic health is financial and, and physical improvements, right? It is a financial benefit to employers here in the United States, to the government in the UK. And it is a, a huge boom to the people's lives that are changing. So money and to the caregivers and to the physicians, because you have job satisfaction now. So going to work, yeah. you know, it's not such a torture anymore. You enjoy what you're doing. So all these things that we're seeing that we have to change the system because the whole compens and at least in the United States, the compensation, the sicker the patient is, the more diagnosis codes, the more I get paid. And that we've got to change that system. You know, because mm. the thinking is, well, you have sick patients, so you should get paid more. Well, keeping people healthy <laughs> it's a lot more time consuming than throwing drugs at, you know, 50 yeah. problems. Yeah. So I think we're I think that the system is good. There's more and more people thinking this way. And so hopefully we can start implementing these changes. So how do people track you down? If they want to pick on you, report yeah. You. If they want to uh, get your services, find out you I, know how to guess, how about the JMH. They have a paper they want to you know. Publish. Yes, I guess I guess you can look at my academic profile at AUT. So um, Karen's an academic AUT. I'm not sure the exact URL there. Um, I can send it to you if you want. Or um, uh, Karenzen.com is my my personal website. So people can um, jump on there for you know consultations. Uh, and I'm, I am on, I am on Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm not on Instagram. Um, but you know, good old email, you know, I'm yeah. a, I'm an old school, good old email. If somebody wants to talk <laughs> or connect, you can just we'll email put, me. 